A simplex converted to a Great Western Railway Prairie Tank, part 100, completing the job at last. Fitting the blower pipe from the steam tap to the hollow stay, adjusting the mechanical lubricator, fitting and piping the live steam injector, making and fitting a whistle mounting, and piping the whistle to the steam turret, followed by a compressed air test. I really do hope that viewers who've actually watched all of the episodes of this series now realise how much work there is to do to rebuild a 5-inch gauge coal-fired steam locomotive, never mind building one from scratch. This clip shows a couple of Jubilee Fittings live steam injectors, these are number 4s. And the nice shiny one on the right that I've cleaned up was actually fitted to my 7.25 inch gauge Titch locomotive for 27 years. And after 27 years I just felt obliged to remove it and buy a new one, but this one works fine so I cleaned it up and it's ready for service. The live steam injector on the left hand side of the picture is the one that was fitted to this locomotive when I got it. Or should I say, not exactly fitted, it was just part of the box of bits that came with the locomotive. The only difference between these two injectors is that the one on the left is painted red and has a water overflow extension pipe fitted. This injector needs a thorough clean up. First of all I'm putting it into an aerosol cap with some acid in it. After a couple of hours in the acid some of the lime scale has been dissolved and I can withdraw the cones. There are two of these, one at each end, and you can't get them mixed up because of the different sizes. This clip shows the other cone almost removed. Now the cones are fully removable, I'm going to put the entire assembly back in the acid for 24 hours. This episode was very difficult to make. And being a one-man band, it was very difficult to video it, because most of the time it was me leaning over the engine, or my arm was in the way, or my hands were in the way. I did get there at the end, this was the first part of the job. There are two steam taps to accommodate two injectors, but I'm only going to fit one. I'm fitting this short length of copper pipe to the left hand tap, because then I can easily put compressed air into the boiler. The pipe was a little bit long, so I trimmed it to the right length. And now it clears the regulator as you can see here. This piece of pipe connects a steam tap on the turret to the hollow stay on the boiler which provides steam for the steam blower in the smoke box. Here I am using my small Barco spanner. I like to use Barco spanners, they are very good indeed. In the 30 years I've been using them I've never yet rounded a nut with one. And these nuts are no exception, they're now both tight. Here once again I'm using the same Barco spanner to close the blowdown valve. I'm just checking that everything is airtight and that all the valves do what they're supposed to do. The hissing noise is a bit of a leak from where the silicone rubber tubing is pushed onto the copper pipe. There is also a bit of a blow past the valves. This is because the engine has been stood for a long time with not much lubrication. Before progressing any further with compressed air tests I need to check that the lubricator under the front panel is supplying oil to the cylinders. I'll just fill it with some oil. This is proper steam cylinder oil to lubricate the cylinders, it's not general lubricating oil. But even though the oil tank has some steam cylinder oil in it, none of it has been pumped to the cylinders, so there's a bit of an adjustment problem. And you can clearly see what the problem is here. I've slowed the video down so you can clearly see what is not happening. Even though the lever is moving back and forth, the teeth on the ratchet wheel are not clearing the pole. There is some adjustment with the two lock nuts to increase or decrease the pressure that the operating arm puts on the ratchet wheel. To adjust the pressure put on the ratchet wheel, first of all I slacken off the lock nut and then I slightly tighten the inner nut to press the operating lever more firmly against the ratchet wheel. These lubricators are generally okay once you get them to work. What's a bit strange with this lubricator is in a previous episode I thought I'd fixed this but obviously not. I'll keep my eye on it, this is not a small steam toy and if the lubrication fails then the cylinders will fail. I ran the engine for much longer than this to just confirm that the ratchet wheel was engaging the pawl at every revolution. It seemed to be ok so I replaced the lid on the tank and put the panel back in place. I'll give it a slightly longer run on compressed air.
That's enough of that. Playtime is over for the moment. I need to pipe the injector. These are not difficult jobs, but very time-consuming. There's a lot of repetition, and you have to be really careful not to scratch the paintwork as you repeatedly make test fits of the piece of pipe. Finally, I got the piece of pipe to exactly the shape that I wanted. Then I silver-soldered the union cones on each end, bearing in mind that the one that fits on the injector is a flat one. This job was incredibly difficult, and you really have to be careful, because if you cross-thread these nuts, then the tap has to come off and you start the job again, and if you're really unlucky, you will damage the thread in the nut and have to re-silver-solder the pipe. I've done that a few times. I've read the books, seen the film, and worn the T-shirts. Finally, I managed to bend the pipe right at the end where it fits on the tap until it was in the perfect position. Only then did the union nut screw onto the thread on the tap with ease. For the fitting job, I'm going to use one of the cleaner injectors just because it looks better and the other one is in the acid. Although this clip is out of sequence, this is before I put it in the acid, and here you can see the purpose of the water overflow extension pipe from the driver's point of view, it makes it much easier to see whether the injector is working when you're driving the locomotive on a track, as the water shoots out to the side and is more visible. Here is another clip from a different angle of the injector in the acid, which was taken from my main acid bath and put in an aerosol cap. Now the injector has a steam inlet, the next thing it needs is a water inlet. These pipes end up in a very strange configuration sometimes. They have to clear various things to get between the injector and where they need to go on the engine. And don't forget, you must not use cones at the injector end, you use special flat fittings. I know this job looks very simple and straightforward, but believe me, it is not. And there are certain rules that you must not break. The water that feeds an injector needs to be cool you always have to turn the water on to this type of injector first and let it run to cool the injector. So when I'm fitting this piece of pipe, I want to make sure that the water pipe is not above the steam pipe. The heat from the steam pipe would heat the water in the pipe going to the injector and you could have problems. This clip is running at four times normal speed just to show how many times I took the pipe out, rebent it, put it back in, took it out, rebent it, etc., etc. The piping goes through holes in the frames and there isn't much room to work here. The other end of the pipe has a really large U bend in it which fits onto the water tap connected to the bunker tank. Eventually I bent the pipe to the correct shape, silver soldered unions on the end of it, and once again this has to be a flat one. And here with some gentle persuasion the union nut fits onto the thread of the injector. I got it as tight as possible with hand pressure and then I finished it off with a small spanner. I didn't use my Barco spanner for this job, as you know variety is the spice of life. The injector is now fitted. The next thing to look at is the whistle. I don't know how good this whistle is, so I held it in place underneath the valve and it sounded alright really. The next part of the job is to do some really crude metal bashing to make a bracket which will hold the whistle in place under the running board. Once I drilled a mounting hole in it, here it is. I have something quite important to say about the fitting of steam whistles. In this clip I'm removing the 4BA bolt that holds the superstructure to the running boards at this point. And here is the whistle, complete with its bracket, which is now bent. This is not bad workmanship, it is intentional. It's vital that the whistle is in such a position so that any condensate can drain out of it, otherwise all you will get is a very watery gurgling sound. Making sure that this part of the whistle is at the lowest point allows the water to drain away. There isn't much room under here. Once I got the whistle in place, I had to use a box key to tighten it. My socket on my socket screwdriver was too wide. I'm piping the whistle using a piece of one eighth of an inch diameter pipe. Normally I'd use 532, but I do find that using larger bore pipe can cause problems with these steam whistles at high working pressures. Instead of getting a pure whistle note, you can get like a shriek or a harmonic. 
Fitting this whistle in place was not good fun. It really took a while to persuade this union nut to go on the end of it. I lost the will to live on several occasions during this piping job, and I really did have to stop once or twice and do something else. It's an exercise in care and patience. You can't put too much pressure on the parts, and you can't put too little pressure on the parts. All the bends have to be in the right place. Personally, I find this to be a very tedious job. Also, when you're silver soldering very small diameter piping, you need to make sure you don't block the ends with silver solder. Always check them before fitting. And now the whistle is piped to the valve. I wonder what it sounds like. It doesn't sound good really, a bit asthmatic, but then the pressure's only at £30 per square inch. I'll pump the pressure up and try again. The working pressure of this boiler is £90 per square inch, and here there's about 70 which is enough to make the whistle sound different. The slide valves are still blowing a bit, it needs more oil, but once the steam gets in there it will wash out all the dirt and particles that have accumulated during the rebuild. Don't forget, the first steam that reaches the cylinders on any steam engine turns to water, and this water is more than adequate to wash out any rubbish that's in the cylinders or the valve chest. Here's a flashback to episode 1. I really think I've improved this engine slightly. This is what it looked like when I bought it from the customer who brought it in to be repaired. Whichever price I was thinking of quoting the customer, it would not have been enough. The number of hours on this project has been excessive. Was it worth it? Well, no, not really from my point of view. It's just made a good video series and hopefully helped quite a lot of people out there who are contemplating rebuilding a 5-inch gauge coal-fired steam locomotive like this one. This can develop into some sort of a disease. Quite a lot of viewers write in with some of the strangest comments. You have to remember that if you work with coal-fired steam engines, they are dirty, mucky, filthy things, just like the full size. This is a part of video number one where I found the problem with the loose crank pin. The engine really was a mess in so many ways. Just cleaning it up took a long, long time. As a rough estimate, I would say maybe five or six hundred hours and that does not include the time it takes to make the video. Once I have the footage that I take in the workshop, each video takes about three hours to complete. Multiply that by 100 episodes, and that's another 300 hours. Here's a look in the box of bits that came with the engine. I'm sure you can recognise one or two of these parts. And that is it. I've moved the engine onto the other part of the workbench because I need the paint to harden on the boiler where I did the repairs before the steam test. I will be performing a gas-fired steam test to just warm everything up and bake the paint onto the boiler. Then I will have to get some help to take it outside the workshop for a coal-fired steam test. And if all these tests are successful, then I will be running it at York Model Engineering Society, of which I am a member. This engine is surprisingly heavy, just adding the two extra wheel sets makes a difference. But I'm sure some kind person will help me move it into the car. And that really is it, 100 episodes completed. How to rebuild a simplex pretending to be a Great Western Railway prairie tank. Stay healthy, thanks for watching, I hope you've enjoyed the series and found it useful in some way or other. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists you can actually watch the videos back to back.